you pick every team as the team you don't want to play, except Philadelphia. Let's start with how we got here. The last piece was the AFC East. It was the full Josh Allen experience, but Buffalo's defense locking down in the second half. And Deontay Hardy's 96-yard punt return, swinging everything. And the results are huge. It sets the Bills up as the two-seed, home against Pittsburgh in round one, and sends Miami to Kansas City. Ooh. Bill Barnwell, you're a Bill. Around the horn to you. Didn't look like it was possible a month ago. Was this late-season flip more about the Bills getting right or the Dolphins losing steam? It was about the Dolphins losing steam because of what we saw last night, Tony. It was the same Josh Allen we saw during that losing streak. <laughs> Left to his devices, joshing it up all over the place. Some incredible plays, but two interceptions in the end zone. A fumble, a miss opportunity at the end of the first half. This was the same Josh Allen. He wasn't any smarter, didn't play any more careful with the football. The Dolphins had an opportunity to win this game, to push the skeptics aside, beat a good team in a game that mattered at the end of December and they collapsed in the second half on offense. 544 second half offenses this season. Dolphins ranked 512th on Sunday in terms of expected points added. They went punt, right. punt, 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 interception and even on the interception drive to a try to throw an interception on the prior play. This Dolphins offense should have won this game, should have put it away before the Bills had a chance to come back and win. Frank, I sold it to you. Yeah, I think the problem with the Dolphins, Bill, was ouch, 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 ouch. They have too many guys hurt. That's the major issue that they have, and they never beat anybody but with a winning record. Let's give Buffalo credit, though. They played their way in. This was a team that was 6-6, six and six, and their six losses all were one score. The punt return may change their entire season because it clearly changed the game. Josh Allen is some of the decision-making poor, absolutely. But the second interception, I would say this. It was a fourth down play. You're turning the ball over anyway. So you actually gained oh, 15 yeah, yards by having them take course, it hey, yeah. to the 25. <laughs> what I had a problem with was the end of the first half. You have to throw the ball into the end zone. You cannot have the half end with the clock running out on the two-yard line. you got to kick a field goal there. Those are the plays which are going to kill you in a playoff game, but make no mistake about it. This team played their way in, and they are their defense is better, and they're healthy. Uh, uh, they weren't healthy. Sounds right. like you were about to say they're the team you don't want to play, Frank. It's sound, hold that thought. Let's go to David Dennis, Jr. Let's take a trip back a few weeks ago when the Dolphins got smacked by the Bills and after the game they said, this is good for us. This is a teachable moment. We're going to learn our lesson. All they seemed to learn was how to lose to more playoff teams. Now this is their fifth <laughs> loss against a playoff team and they have half as many points again those games and they score against bad teams. They allow twice as many points than they do against bad teams and that second half performance 57 yards in that second half. That's the least amount the Bills have allowed since 2021. That Dolphins squad, you know, folded in that second half in a game, as Bill mentioned, where the Bills were trying to hand them the game. Two, uh, you know, touchdown interceptions and then basically another turnover at the end of the first half. That game should have been over at halftime. And in the, in the, this is about what the Dolphins did. Now they're going to the Chiefs and, uh, you know, in freezing weather in Arrowhead where there's no way they're going to win that game. Oh, you're already calling it over. Okay. <laughs> and Ramona <laughs> Shelburne to you. I mean, Bill, Bill's right in that it is the Josh Allen we've seen. There was a lot of turnover. It was a bad play. But let's go back to when Ken Dorsey gets fired, okay, as the offensive coordinator, mm -hmm. and they replace him with Joe Brady. Mm -hmm. If you, you think this turnaround has coincided with this decision, except on every offensive metric, they're actually worse. <laughs> they're actually worse. Is that right? I matters, saw they were 6-1 and one since that, but, but you're telling me the <laughs> offense metrically is okay. But wait, what, what, what Josh Allen does is make – plays at the end of that game. I mean, that was theater. It was set up just like the AFC Championship game a couple years ago against Patrick Mahomes. You see Tua on the sideline waiting to get his chance to go back against Josh Allen. And then Josh delivered. He got those first downs. He ran the clock. Tua gets into the game, and as Bill mentioned, almost a pick almost a pick on the play before he throws the pick. It's just set up to be the Dolphin stage, and they absolutely blew it at the end. Could it just be? They had the injuries. They also didn't have Waddle Moster in the game. They packed it in, Bill, and they can get it back next week and have a game versus Kansas City? Or are you with David that it's donezo for this team? 
I mean, the Chiefs don't look great, haven't looked great for a couple months. It's a Terry Kill revenge game, but I just don't think they're going to have the pass rush without maybe their three best pass rushers against Patrick Mahomes. So, no, I, I'm sitting winning again. We had a horn. We keep it moving. And now to the NFC East. Could the Cowboys be that one team you don't want to face? How uh, they took the NFC East was equal measure how Philly gave it away. It was shocking. Had the Eagles packed it in at half versus the Giants and how they looked for the last month, Jalen Hurts now has an atrociously bent finger, and A.J. Brown is banged up. If you're trying to be optimistic, maybe you could say versus Tampa is not much different than versus Green Bay, which is the matchup they could have had if they won. Frank, how can it be the Eagles seem done, and what is the number one reason? I'll tell you what, you cannot start a season 10-1 and one and at the very least not win the division. That You're put in a position where you should be having a bye this week and then you have two home games like they had last year to get to the Super Bowl. And you look at that defense with Matt Patricia there and the head coach, Nick Sirianni, Matt Patricia have to take a bit of a hit. That's Tyrod Taylor. That's not Tommy Cutlets doing that. That's Tyrod Taylor. Over 400 yards in offense and the Giants blew them out. And you can say, well, the game, does it really matter? Yeah, kind of every game matters when you play the way that they did in December. So injuries have been a factor. Jalen Hurts, who was an MVP type of performer the first couple of months, has not played well, and their defense has been really poor. Are they done? Frank, I saw. I'll give you a point-blank question. I, I, don't, I don't think they are because Tampa is not a world beater, so maybe they can get that mojo back. But right now, they look like a dead team. David walk. Dennis Jr., you think Miami's done. Is Philly done? Uh, Philly's not done uh, because, again, that Tampa Bay team looked really, really bad uh, yesterday, only putting up nine points against a Carolina team that's actively trying to lose. But I want to go back to Friday where I said best-case scenario for this Eagles team is a 24-0 halftime score, and they can rest their starters in the second half. That's exactly what happened, Tony. Give me all the points you want, buddy. That's, that's pretty much what happened. But my, my issue with the Eagles, though, going forward is, again, the last six games. We've not seen a team lose five of their last six games games and you know go far in the playoffs only six teams have done that and the farthest they've gotten is the divisional round the offense looks bad defense looks bad 25 points allowed those teams do not make the Super Bowl so I I, I think they can win next week but I don't know how far they can go Shelburne. I mean I, I was all set to go with you on this Tampa Bay thing like they beat him in week three uh, there's almost like a you could almost make an argument that they were so bad yesterday against the Giants the Giants that, with, with, is this intentional? Like, is this? Did they want to play Tampa Bay because Baker Mayfield looks a little injured? Like, but they, they couldn't even beat the Giants, you guys. If we're trying to say they have a good matchup against Tampa Bay, they couldn't. They got smoked by the Giants. So I, I don't know with Philly. Where I want do to see you if think Browns the blame, okay. if, if, if you are in fact throwing blame out here, Ramona lies for Philadelphia? It's got to be with the defense. I, mean, I think that since they made the change in coordinator, they, ha it's, it, they have underperformed in every way on the defensive side of the ball. And Bill Barnwell. We've talked about the coverage, the change of coordinator. They're leaving guys open. The coverage is a problem. But the break in case of emergency thing for this defense was supposed to be the pass rush. They had 70 sacks last year, Tony. One of the highest marks in NFL history. They're down to 43 this year. Their top three edge rushers, Brandon Graham, their backup, veteran backup, Josh Schwett and Hassan Reddick. They had 38 sacks combined last year. They have nearly half that mark this season. And their edge rushers, their top edge rushers, have zero sacks over the last month of football for the Philadelphia Eagles. We know the coverage is going to hold up, but they have to get their pass rush going if they want. Is that something that can turn around in a week? Or, or do you believe they're done, Bill Barnwell? I think they can beat the Bucks. I don't think they're getting any further than that. AFC South came down to one play. And Trevor Lawrence switched that one play at the snap to go to a QB sneak where he reached, got no push. His own blockers got in the way. He was about... Two inches short. And that's how we got this Houston dream season. C.J. Stroud versus Cleveland in round one. Texans, ahead of schedule or David? Was it a Jags collapse here in the AFC's house? <clears throat> the Jacksonville Jaguars had a 98% chance to make the playoffs as of week 12. You cannot look at this and say that this is a team that, this is a team that absolutely folded under pressure. But... You cannot fold under pressure unless there's pressure being applied to you, and that Texan squad deserves 
all of the credit for doing this. Fifth time that you've had a rookie coach and a rookie quarterback make the playoffs. This is a miraculous run, and I found myself rooting for that squad because Stroud is on the top half of the quarterbacks you're going to see all playoffs. And this is, you know, I don't want to get ahead of, ahead of schedule here, but this is a dangerous team. That oh, here we go. Play. All right, Ramona Shelford, how about you? I think it's all about the Texans, too. I mean, they, listen, they lost to the Browns in Week 16, but they didn't have C.J. Stroud. And I, and I think when you talk about how they got themselves into the playoffs, they started strong. Obviously, they fell off when he had his concussion issues, but he's back. And when you see him and, and, and Nico Collins together and the way that they have that the first beautiful. play of the game, like I, I think it's I, I think that Texans team is the story here. And I know we can focus on the, the audible and all that, but, but for them to go from as bad as they were last year to this – is this one of the stories of the Bill Barnwell. Jags were 8-3, and three, had a chance to be the top yeah. seed in the AFC, and kept losing games. Dorrance got hurt. That made a big difference. But they had two chances late to tie up that game, that fourth down sneak and a touchdown throw to Calvin Ridley that was off of his fingertips. The Jaguars blew that. The Texans, to be fair, I don't think they were that much better. They had an opportunity to give up a, a pass in the flat on fourth down, what is up first and goal with a few seconds left. They could have lost that game and been out of the postseason with things breaking differently. To me, I think the Texans kind of limped their way to the end. The Jaguars totally Frank crushed. Isola. Yeah, Jacksonville gave it away. They had 12 turnovers their last six games. That, that's a big part of it. But I'll give you Ooh. three words. C.J. Stroud. This is what happens when you hit it right in the draft. You want to say they got a, bit, a little bit lucky? That's fine. 4,000 yards passing, 23 touchdowns, five interceptions. Look at all these teams looking for a quarterback. They might have lucked into one. It's happened a, a plenty of times before, and that's a great place to start. Playoff matchups set. Take a look at the brackets. You can't ask people to not sleep on everybody because people need sleep. So who's jumping out of you, Bill Barr? Well, who's most dangerous or best position or best road, whatever you like? The Eagles are the team you do want to play in the postseason. <laughs> yes, we've established that already. Frank Isola, how about you? The New York Bills, I feel like it's there. Oh, year. now we're giving you a meal for that. you got to get Buffalo at the front of that sentence. They, they're from New York. That's David Dennis Jr. Thing. Ravens have been smacking good teams all season. Yes, of course, the enjoy. one seed is the team. Well, you guys, uh, have you ever done this before? Go ahead, Ramona Shelburne. <laughs> I'm sitting in the Bill Plasky honorary homer seat, so I'm going to say the L.A. Oh, Rams. finally! You Somebody said Gumbel. something here. At least, Look at all that. right, there we go. Let's take a break by ourselves next. <laughs> T-minus two hours and 30 minutes from tonight's national championship. As with all enormous things, we wait, we wait, and then it's here. It's like, I don't know if I'm ready yet. You're, you're finally here, and I'm a mess. Michigan, Washington, you have seen how they swept through the season unbeaten and how they've dominated and hurled and motivated themselves through everything this year thrown at them, right or wrong. In the history of title games, number one has played number two 17 times. Anyone know the record? Eight and nine. Oh. It's nine and eight, but oh. the number two has beaten the number one nine times. That's what I meant. Well, you didn't say it. You got it. It's nice here. It's kind of a stunner there. So taking that into consideration, and everything this season has told you already, David Dennis Jr., around the horn to you, the number one thing that will decide tonight's game. At the risk of being as obvious as my Ravens uh, pick of the team we don't want to see in the playoffs, this is going to come down to uh, Michael Penix and, and, you know, being a one-man show. We've seen sort of overpowered teams in the past win these championships. You think about Vince Young and Cam Newton and things like that. They're obviously playing against a Michigan squad that's only allowed 20 points uh, three times this season. But this Washington squad is scoring 37 points a game. If they can get up in that 28-point uh, range, I think they can pull this off. Right, guys. So I saw you. I saw you smirk when he said Michael Penix is uh, the X factor for for better or worse. Well, yeah, because he's one of the best players on the team. That's why David's smart. Always stick with the best players. I will say this too. The offensive line of Washington is going to be big because they're terrific, but Michigan gets after the quarterback. First of all, let's give credit to the start time for tonight. It is a school night. It's good that they're starting at a reasonable time. Michigan, think about this. They have trailed all season for a total of 41 minutes and 43 seconds. As someone who's always playing behind on this show, that gets demoralizing after a while when you're always chasing a big team like Michigan. But I think Michigan is too physical, but it also seems to be their year. His Jim Harbaugh was suspended for six games. They talk about all the adversity. They never mentioned we created the adversity. 
So it just feels like it's going to be Michigan's year. We're going to have to put up with all the maize and blue fans. Yes, but you, that's what you're wearing today. You cut, if you squint. I saw the kind of looks well, I like, like the coach. If you squint, he looks like Jim Harbaugh. Is that right? I do like Don't the coach. Don't you see it right there? Bill Barnwell, the number one thing that will decide tonight's national championship. Michigan's ability to stop that Washington deep passing attack. They have more deep completions than anybody else in the country this year. They just lit up Texas a week ago, and Michigan's defense is weak at one thing. And it is stopping that deep pass. They're number one in the country in QBR allowed on passes 20 yards or closer to the line of scrimmage. Once you get the ball 20 yards or more deep, they are 86. That right. From first to 86 when they go deep, the opposing offense. So if they can get those passes off on Washington's perspective, Michigan's going to have some trouble stopping them. So whether it's the pass rush, whether it's holding up in coverage, they got to stop Michael Penix from finding Roma Dunze deep for all those big games. And Ramona Shelburne, the number one thing to decide tonight. Well, you know how many times Michael Penix has been sacked this year? 11. 11 times he's been sacked all year. So what Bill's talking about, if he... He has the best deep ball in the country. He's only the, only the second only the second person to go to throw for 4,500 yards back to back seasons since Patrick Mahomes. Okay, if they if they can protect him, if he has time to get the ball up, I like Washington because no, we thought they were going to be to Oregon once, let alone twice, and we thought they'd be here, and yet here they are with the, one of the best quarterbacks in the game. And I know he's not talked about as the top draft pick in this class, but I, I bet come April we're talking about him rising up the draft board, and somebody believes in him. All right, it's time to make a pick, game. Ramona. You just did. You said you're taking Washington. Pack 12, swan song. Pack 12. Let's go. David Dennis Jr. <laughs> I'm going with Washington as well. Frank Isola. Jim Harbaugh wins his last college game tonight. Goes out of chance. Oh. And Bill Barnwell. I picked UW to win when the, the schedule came out. I'm still picking UW now. David Dennis Jr., Frank Isola, thanks for your time today. It's going to be a Shelburne Barnwell showdown next. Ramona Shelburne, Bill Barnwell, good luck in showdown. There's a play you've never seen before. At the end of week 18 of two teams not making the playoffs, but we're going to talk about it here. It led to the heat at the end of Saints-Falcons. You saw Arthur Smith in his last act as head coach barking at Dennis Allen. It wasn't just a run-up touchdown. It was a victory formation expected kneel, but huddle overrules coach. Here's Jameis Winston explaining it half the game. He, he didn't condone that at all. Yeah. You know, he, he didn't. However, uh, we decided as a team to do it. I think it should be forgotten, especially when the score is already 41-17. Uh, so I, I don't know how, how much worse it can get. So that's Jameis Winston saying the team was overriding the coach with the call. When asked what happens next year when these two teams play twice, Winston laughed. We just played yesterday. <laughs> so, Bill, can Jameis Winston overrule and the players overrule coach? Apparently they can, but it's not a good idea because it's not about just going for it in that situation. It's going for it out of a kneel-down situation in victory formation. Next year, if the Saints are lucky enough to be kneeling down against any team, let alone the Falcons, teams are going to be diving at their linemen's legs. They're going to be going after their quarterback, knowing that they can't just let up. So Jameis Winston kind of created uh, a mess for the team next year. Ramona Shelburne. I also am wondering about Jamal Williams, okay? They, they ostensibly they did this so that he could have a touchdown this year because he hadn't scored all year and they wanted to do this for their guy. But like, does that feel good? Like you just scored against a team that was kneeling <laughs> that, down. That, you, I, I don't that's know. That's not a bad You're gonna look at the stats, it looks better than the stats, but not I don't a bad know. thought, but like, this is a rivalry between these two teams. Don't we love that in our rivalries, that they play and hate each other? Who knows who's going to be playing each other next year? All the rosters may be, may be new next year, but I like it in my rivalry. We'll move on. Warriors presenting Otto Porter with his 2022 championship ring in 2024. Cool or too delayed, Ramona? It feels pretty delayed. I mean, it's like when they tape Survivor and they don't air the winner for an, a year and a half later and the people involved have to go on with their lives. A lot's happened. Otto Porter only played eight games last year for Toronto. Like, the Warriors are falling apart. What? I don't know. It just feels a long time ago. It, it, it's cool because the Warriors need to do anything to remind their fans of other Warrior seasons that are less depressing than this one. They should be honoring Monte Ellis for his most improved player award for 2006 before the game next week. Bill Barnwell's got jokes. He's got cheese. He doesn't have a face time. Ramona Shelburne, take it. It's all yours. 
Well, Draymond Green is back in the NBA, and he announced that he was back on his own podcast, as he does. And he essentially said he thought about retiring when this latest incident happened and the NBA was suspending him indefinitely. And that Adam Silver went to him and said, no, don't retire, you're making a rash decision. Look, I, I love the showmanship of doing this on your podcast and being open and vulnerable the way that Draymond is. I hope that he's had enough time away to really get some perspective so we can see the Draymond of old and not the Draymond that we just saw over the last couple of weeks. Over. Today's winner. That's our time. We're on a 23 and a half hour break.